A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast from the art newspaper in which I talk to artists about their influences from writers to musicians, filmmakers and of course other artists and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's A Brush With Nalini Milani, whose work in drawing and painting, performance, video and installation responds to contemporary politics and human rights issues through the language of ancient myths of poets, writers and thinkers and of the history of art. Nalini is increasingly celebrated for her installations that she calls animation chambers fusing video and drawings text and voice which engulf the viewer in environments that contain endlessly shifting sequences of imagery and stirring soundtracks a call to action in terms of both their political and cultural content. Nalini was born in Karachi in 1946, a year before partition, which separated Imperial British India into India and Pakistan. Karachi became part of Pakistan and Nalini's family were among millions of refugees in the territory. They eventually moved to Calcutta and then to Bombay or Mumbai, where Nalini still lives today. She studied at the JJ School of Art there between 1964 and 1969 and had a studio at the Bulabai Memorial Institute, where she was part of a multidisciplinary community in which art, music, dance and theatre were practised both individually and collectively. Though drawing underpinned her work then, as it does now, she made early forays into video art in this period, including in Dream Houses of 1969, now in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Here, Nalani looked at the idealism of modernist architecture during the tenure of Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first Prime Minister, and linked forms she constructed in cardboard and then captured in stop-motion animation to the art of the Bauhaus. For the later film Utopia in 1976, Nanali fused dream houses with footage of a woman looking over an urban development, apparently adding a critical edge to her original piece and introducing the mixing of techniques that are the hallmark of her later moving image work. After a pivotal period in France in the 1970s, as we'll hear, Nalani returned to India and through the 1980s primarily made drawings and paintings in mixed media with a strong social message, as well as in 1985 organising the first exhibition of women artists to be staged in Delhi. In 1992, India was shaken by sectarian violence after Hindu extremists destroyed the Babri Mosque and it marked a turning point in Nalani's practice. Among the first works she made following these events was City of Desires, an example of what she has called her erasure performances, which she said was an indictment against the rise of Hindu fundamentalism, which was allowing the destruction of the most beautiful aspects of its culture from the past. At the same time, she was working on an ongoing project across multiple media, taking the character of Medea from the myth of Jason and the Argonauts as a means of exploring colonialism and its legacies. With an increasing conviction that the most appropriate form in which to respond to social political events in India was through the popular and universal form of the moving image, she increasingly worked in multimedia from this point. Her first large-scale video installation was remembering Turbotech Singh from 1998 to 99, which reflected on India's nuclear weapons tests of that time and used imagery of the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The video installation Unity in Diversity from 2002, as we'll hear, was a further reaction to Hindu nationalism and sectarian violence, this time bloodshed in Gujarat. In the early 2000s, she began to develop what she called video shadow plays. Game pieces from 2003, for instance, features six suspended cylinders made from the sheets of the plastic mylar painted on the reverse with images of animals which were lit by the beams of projectors with video imagery of the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombs. The piece also contained animated images which Nalini has called graffiti of gods and demons from the Hindu pantheon. The video shadow plays grew increasingly ambitious in works like In Search of Vanished Blood from 2012 which features six synchronised films and six rotating mylar cylinders. The voice of Cassandra, another figure from ancient mythology tells a story of violence especially against women accompanied by animations responding to works from art history and to footage of contemporary conflict the piece is in the collections of both Tate and Guggenheim from the video shadow plays Nalini moved into the 
animation chambers, increasingly using animated drawings made on an iPad alongside the video material. Can You Hear Me from 2020 was prompted by the horrific story of the rape of an eight-year-old girl in Kashmir and, as Natalie put it, explored how the idea of nation or the idea of community and group is marked on the bodies of women. The work features 88 overlapping animations projected on the walls of the gallery, including everything from hand-drawn images and notes to fragments of printed text. In My Reality is Different from 2022 to 23, Nanini worked with 25 historic paintings from the collections of the National Gallery in London and the Hoban Museum in Bath, fusing details of pictures by artists including Holbein, Rubens and Wright of Derby with the animated iPad drawings that she's called Thought Bubbles, which address contemporary geopolitical concerns alongside the colonial histories that underpin the historic works of art and their resonances today. Again, the story of Cassandra dramatically accompanied these teeming images. Standing amid Nalini's animation chamber, I remember being conscious that the imagery was morphing so consistently that no two moments were the same, a hugely important element in her practice ever since she made the first video shadow plays in the 2000s. And it's this with which I began our conversation. How does this constant movement of images and sound affect the meaning of her works? The animations go quite fast, and yes, it is the slippage. In the case of Can You Hear Me, which was showing at the White Chapel, there I do it purposefully, and actually, because I want people to just get a glimpse of the quote and go back to their source, because that's a kind of a cheating way of getting people to look at that source. Also to try to connect to what I'm actually using in the visual, which actually had to do with the rape of a little girl, an eight-year-old girl. Uh, and the urgency of it is such that uh, it's the trauma that one experiences when one encounters these things uh, and hears about them in the press and so on. So yes, there is that. However, in uh, my reality is different. My idea was to show different aspects of that painting and then incorporate it in the animation such that if the viewer then goes back to see that painting, would then say, oh, now where was it? What was that? And I think artists are very observant about details in the old classics. For example, there is the robe of the Madonna in one case, where Christ is being brought off the cross. And the Madonna is, she is of course weeping and she's in mourning, but the robe is like jagged mountain peaks the blue, and it's like the mood or the emotion of the woman that is being expressed by the artist. So these are things I think that, you know, artists do notice, and I would like to bring that to the attention of the viewer as well. Absolutely, and and so when you talk about going back to the source, you want your viewers to, to leave the exhibition and embark on a kind of research, effectively. Yes, I do. Yes, I'll tell you why I say that. You know, when I read literature from another part of the world, for example, Dr. Faustus by Thomas Mann, what interests me in that particular book is the annotations and the historicity. Otherwise, you know, I haven't lived through that war. And it wasn't a first-hand experience or, or even a second-hand one if it was parents. So that's what I have enjoyed doing. I mean, in the sense that it enriches the span of how I can understand the work. Absolutely. And of course, one of the ways that you explain your experience or interpret the imagery that you're using or the text that you're using is through your hand. And I really love the fact that you've described your iPad drawings and drawing generally as thought bubbles. In other words, you're thinking through the process of drawing. Tell us more about that. I find that I can work my ideas out through drawing. When I did get this iPad some years ago, I found an app which was for children. It was for 12-year-olds. I tried using the pencil, which I hated, and I, I found I, I was happier with the touch. It was like, you know, when you actually paint, you're also using the end of your fingers, mm. your fingertips. Similarly, with the iPad, with this particular app, I could actually draw directly with my fingers. And there is a sort of tactility and something more organic rather than just the digital that uh, interests me. 
And tell us more about the ways in which those iPad drawings are formed, because you describe them as like a sketchbook in a way. So they take place in a kind of public sphere, but they're almost a private practice. So there's an interesting tension there, isn't there? Because people are able to see these often very private actions of yours. The first set that I made, uh, Can You Hear Me?, which was, I edited it down to about 88. Uh, There were about 150. It didn't start as a project for an exhibition at all. Things were happening around us here in this part of the world, which were uh, getting uh, more and more traumatic, especially for women and for young girls. And also the sectarian part of our culture was very uh, disturbing. I had to do something. I mean, I'm not the person to go on the streets and go on demonstrations. In any case, that was getting more and more difficult anyway. So this was my way of shouting out about these things. And I made a whole number of them. And then I had a young colleague who said, you know, this is perfect for Instagram. I said, well, this is exactly fits my bill because I like to make public art. You know, my wall drawings are like that and, uh, you know, large... Mm -hmm later on, our large animations on, on facades and so on. So she showed me how to do this. And ever since then, I posted it like kind of a diary form that, you know, things had happened and I was then going to make a drawing and then post it on Instagram. So anybody can partake of them and, uh, you know, download it if they wish. And so it's free art. And that means of protesting or shouting, as you say, your means of registering your political convictions. That's really consistent right the way through your practice, wasn't it? Because even Dream Houses, which was effectively an architectural project, a film, you know, in which you're looking at architecture, that was directly connected to social political events in India. And your erasure drawings, which you were making in the 90s, were again a means of responding to the very turbulent scenes that were happening in India at that moment. So tell us more about that conviction always to respond. Well, you know, in this part of the world, there are difficult issues that come up every now and again. And there is a kind of a hierarchy here where you find a whole section of society almost in denial, largely the bourgeoisie. And you want to bring this to the notice of the bourgeoisie in one sense. And therefore, if I do choose to show in a museum in South Bombay or in a gallery, it's more to address that class of person because it's really that denial that I am shouting about. (laughs) So why do I choose to address political issues is because I think it's humanistic, really, not to do with politics as such, but it affects us as as people, you know. It's, It's the least one can do to extend a hand and to see what can one do to help the other. And do you see there being a continuity between those erasure drawings, those performances, and what you're doing on the iPad today? Is there a kind of continuum in terms of your language in that time? There is one continuum, which is, you know, to try to make art as public as possible and not have a value which is a money value. I mean, to say a cliched thing, art is really priceless. One of the consistent elements of that, of course, is this idea that you can interpret contemporary events through the past. And there are these mythical figures that reoccur and reoccur in your work. Cassandra, Media, Helen of Troy in the National Gallery's My Reality is Different. Why turn to them? What is it about them that can have a currency? What do they tell us now, if you like? We know myths, whether they are Greek or Indian, have a universal truth about them. And they are like snowballs. You know, they've come to us through the ages. Many writers have chosen to write plays or books about those characters. And they, in a sense, become more and more contemporary. And I want to bring them right into our daily life. Because what Cassandra has to tell us is that she could see or intuitively know what was going to happen. But the fact is, nobody was listening to her. And in one sense, for me, that's female thought intuition and instinct and prognosis are very much to do with the feminine side of one's brain. It has not to do so much with gender, to my mind, because I think that each human being has both the feminine and the masculine. I do not believe that those two words have to do with the sex of the person. I saw that you said that because those historic mythological figures were 
they were a means of accessing female thought. They were an example of a potential positive influence over what we feel and think today. And I just was interested in how that manifests, if you like. Well, the first thing is that it also forms a link language. People have read about these things, about these characters. And it's the same with Indian myths, Ram, Sita, and so on. The stories are known, even as children we were told these stories. And that already is one way of communicating. For me, that's key, communication. And that's how I find that if you and I can understand that character, we can go on to talk about our times, our current issues. And tell us about reverse painting, because I know that this is something that you worked very early on with Bupen Kaka. He was an early tutor of yours. So obviously reverse painting has in common lots of other artistic forms like printing, where a reverse image is made and so on. Is it an artistic discipline that is very different to, for instance, making images on the iPad in the sense that you have having to constantly test yourself in terms of making a reverse painting? Because, of course, you have to see everything, if you like, the wrong way round. <laughs> <laughs> no, you see, what happened was that I went to an art school in Bombay, one of the art schools established by the British. Hmm. There were five such art schools. And uh, I think when the British were here, they wanted their portraits painted, etc. And so we learned how to do oil painting in the British style. Not the best, let me tell you. <laughs> so afterwards, when I started to say, well, what do I want to do as an artist? I chose to use a folk art form, which is reverse painting. It's normally used for decorating the backs of a bed or a cupboard. It's more like a, a decoration. And actually what happened in 1989, Bupen had done a workshop in Hungary on reverse painting. And he came back and then we had a commission, three artists, Vivan Sundaram, Bupen Kakkar and myself, to do a large mural. And he said, let's do it in glass. It was about 500 square feet of a wall. But he said, it's on the beach and there are palm trees outside. And this enormous mural that we'll do, you know, after a few years, this family is going to hate us. <laughs> so <laughs> he said, let's do reverse painting. The entire mural would be reverse painting. So there would be times in the day when the glass becomes a mirror and they will see the landscape outside. So I said, this is brilliant. It's like, now you see me, now you don't. Got you, yeah. And it, then if you want to see the painting, you wait till the sun goes down, and then you see the painting. So this, it sort of reveals itself. So Bupen taught Vivan and me whatever he had learned in Hungary, and so we proceeded to make this glass painting, which still is there in that house. And they're quite happy with it, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> How lovely. But of course, it's continued through your work. And I think particularly yes. of yeah. works like In Search of Vanished Blood, which use the idea of reverse painting so constructively within these shadow play images. So right. tell us about how you've then used those. Well, I love the medium and I like the very fact that we had to sit on the floor to make them, not use an easel. Uh -huh. So, you know, like canvas painting is on an easel. Mm. So I sit on the floor, cross-legged, like the traditional artists in India. And I wanted to extend the idea of how else I could use this technique that Bupen had taught us. And I discovered this material called mylar polyester film, which is used for overhead projection. But you get them in different thicknesses. So I was able to source rather thick mylar, and they formed really good drums. It all started actually with a theatre play that I was working on with Anuradha Kapoor, the theatre director. Mm -hmm. uh, and we decided to do a play based on Bertolt Brecht's uh, story called The Job. It was in the experimental theatre here in Bombay. We decided not to have any blackouts for change of scenery or change of, uh, of costume. It was to be in a kind of a factory. And I made these cylinders like pistons in a factory. And each piston went over the protagonist. And she changed into something else with the painting I had done of, you know, another costume. Because she changed from being a woman to a man because she takes on her husband's job as a night watchman. And then there's also a scene where there's a, there's a train journey. So when they twirl, it becomes like going on a train, etc. So that's how it started, because it was actually the function of it was in the theatre play. But when they came down from the flies, they started to 
twirl anyway and they cast shadows. So in the midst of this play, we had real problems with the actors who wouldn't want to travel with them. And so I said to myself, well, this could become a shadow play on its own. You know, it's always one thing and another. You know, one thing pushes out another idea and this is how it happened. And it was, of course, an extension of reverse painting. Well, let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? Uh, Nasreen Mohammadi. Ah. Not so well known earlier days in the West, but now she is, unfortunately, after she passed away in 1990. Mm. Her work was actually quite different from mine, but I learned a lot from it. She was actually, for me, the first installation artist. She actually taught me how one could install in a manner that could form the trajectory for the viewer. So the first time she asked me to help her to set up a show in Bombay in a public space, in a public gallery, not a private gallery or a commercial gallery, she had hired a space which was kind of a rectangle. All her work was in squares. So she said, we are going to measure the whole thing into a square and then we are going to paint the walls white. That's what we did. And then we looked at all the work and she said, now, as you walk in, this is what you'll see first. This is what you'll see next. And this is the entire planning that we did. It was in the 70s right. after she'd come back from a scholarship in Paris. I really l learned a lot from her. Later, we worked together at the dark room and uh, we did a series of photographs together. Later on in 1971, it was, the word curator didn't exist. So I said, you know, Nasreen, I, I would appreciate it very much and I'd be honoured if you chose the photographs I want to show in, in a gallery along with paintings of the same size. Because photography was not acceptable as an art form in India. And I wanted people to see that it had the same valency as a painting would. So she is the one who chose the paintings and uh, helped me to set up that show. And I, I have great regard and respect for how she worked. Her studio and her, her surroundings, it was like, uh, almost like a monk. Right. Uh, and and uh, her knowledge of, of, of Zen Buddhism and uh, Islamic spirituality was fantastic. It was so deep and profound. Also, she's the one who taught me a lot about Indian music. Ah, okay. But you absolutely sense that interest in Zen and so on from the work, right? It's so spare, but it's, it's got that sort of incredible yes. luminosity and beauty about it. Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. Which historical artist do you turn to the most today? You know, it's not one artist, and it's always very difficult to say because so many artists have really influenced one. But for me, the most important period, let's say, is Kalighat painting. Mm. Now, Kalighat painting, in fact, there are a few hundreds of them at the V&A. Some of the best, really. Yeah. And we have to thank Mildred Archer for that, for collecting these. Kalighat painting happened in the 19th century in Calcutta. The artists had become rather impoverished because the Indian royalty itself had become quite poor because of the British in India. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have that patronage anymore for religious works. So they would sit around the Kali temple and paint these very quick watercolors of the goddess Kali, for which they got one rupee at that time, so something like this. Yeah. But in the meanwhile, they would sit idle and they would make stories about the people around them. So it was the first time that you saw secular India, you know, a man and a woman who had a relationship a woman walking her dog, things of that nature. It's always material that sometimes dictates the form. And in this case, watercolors came from Britain. Right. They didn't have to grind this anymore. They didn't have to grind their own colors. So it was quick. And also there was cheap newsprint paper. So if you ever go to the v &A, you'll see rather cheap paper, but it's lasted. That's great. Yeah. So they do this very quick kind of watercolor drawings of things around them. Later on, when I was in Paris, when I saw Léger, I realized the shadows on the bodies of his people 
was so much like Kalighat. I don't know That's if Lecce so ever saw this, but uh, for me, that was a link. So yes, so you know that historical moment carries further into uh, other times. I know those paintings well, actually, in the V&A. The thing that always strikes you is that amazing directness, because if you're looking at something like yeah. mogul painting or something, it's the intricacy and that incredible delicacy and refinement. And then when yeah. you see the Caligat paintings, it's that, that incredible directness, as you say, mm. you've, they're done very quickly and that sort of urgency about them is so striking. Yes. Does that come into your own work? Because, of course, when I think about your work, and particularly the animations in My Reality is Different, there is that incredible urgency and directness. So does Caligat painting actually affect the way that you work? Yes, it does. It does, certainly, absolutely. You're right there. I have used actual Caligat painting images in my shadow plays. Ah, yes. You see a Durga image and you see the lion that she sits on, etc. I have many of those images in the shadow plays. I wanted to talk about Francisco Goya because I know that he was an important figure in In Search of Vanishing Blood. And you directly quote from those disasters of war prints in those. Right. Tell us why it was important yeah. to look back to him. Well, Goya's disasters of war, I've had his work quoted in many of my works. And I think that that period, in some sense as well reflects things that are happening on this part of the world. So, you know, there's somebody who's done this and has found a visual form for it. Not only the disaster of it, but there's also a comic aspect to it, you know. There is a part of Goya which tries to lighten up the issue or make it absurd, you know. I mean, soon after he does the capriccio, so you can see that already, that it's the absurdity of one human being killing another. And for what? You know, it's the absurdity of that, which you see also in many of the other great writers. For example, again, in my part of the world, a writer called Manto, M-A-N-T-O, mm-hmm. Sadat Hassan Manto. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of that absurdity that comes into short stories, even though the atrocities of partition were absolutely traumatic. But at the same time, he's able to bring out the absurdity of such a trauma. With Goya, it's often in the text, isn't it? In the sense that you might have this shocking image and then the text might introduce another flavour entirely. And again, that's something that you use productively, isn't it? The correspondence between image and text. Yes, I do use a lot of text. and Goya gives us that. I find that a very important device to have people enter the work. It gives you a, a way in. In your film, Unity in Diversity, made in 2002 you worked with a very specific painting as a kind of source material for the video work that you produced. Can you say something about that? That was a painting by Raja Ravivarma. Why that painting and what did it offer you in terms of exploring that subject and that work? The painting is called Galaxy of Musicians and it's 11 women with different musical instruments, but they're also dressed in the different costumes of India. And from the costume, you can tell where she is from, and you can also tell what is her religion. So it's these 11 women coming together, uh, harmoniously playing, and that was the idea of India, unity and diversity. And in uh, 2002, we had terrible sectarian problems and violence. Mm. I mean, some people would even say genocide in the state of Gujarat. Mm. And in one sense, that harmony, that coming together, unity and diversity is what we had lived with and, and were striving towards and to continue into our future. That broke down. And that's the reason why I use Galaxy of Musicians as a metaphor for those times where the, the agenda of, of democracy in India was that. So is the mood of that film then a kind of lament, as it were, or is it also expressing a hope that it might happen again, if you know what I mean? Is there a hope for unity? Well, it's in a way to fervently hope, let's say, but the ferventness is is dire. It's really like saying, for God's sake, let's put this together and, you know, let's make it work. And it's obviously got a tremendous potency today because, of course, Modi had a position of power in Gujarat at that time and is now Prime Minister of of India. So it must therefore have a particular resonance for you today. It does. And yet, you know, we are in a situation where we are soon going to have elections and for the third time he's going to come in and things have become very difficult for a lot of people who speak out. Mm, Indeed. Let's talk about contemporary art. Which contemporary artists do you most admire? 
It's Louise Bourgeois, actually. We don't see much of her work in this part of the world. It's largely, you know, reproductions and so on. I did meet her, though. Her studio was not very far from the gallery where I show in New York, Gallery Le Long. Ah. The, the thing about her life, it was from her childhood that she had experienced certain things in her family, which had a traumatic effect on her. And it was an agenda that she carried right through in her life, even t- till the time that there is a photo of her by Maplethorpe. Uh, it's about the father, mm. and always the father that creates a huge trauma for her. And it's the very fact that she tries to find a visual form for these very intense emotions that I find absolutely amazing. And the main thing is memory and the transmission of the memory. And that, for me, is key. That device of memory has been part of my art making from the very beginning. And I, I take her way of working as a kind of model. Right. And, and also one of the things I think that's consistent with her work and yours is that sense of the body as a kind of transmitter of psychological intensity, if you like, in the, in the sense that you've consistently used the body as a kind of site yes. for all sorts of textual and poetic and emotional language, if you like. That's true. Very true. Perhaps it has to do with being a woman in the sense that the transformations that a woman's body goes through throughout her life are immense, you know, from the time that a little girl grows up and, you know, there's puberty and the changes in the body during puberty and whether one has a child or not, it still goes through that period of a notion of the possibility of having the child and to bear it. And later on, you know, you start to menopause and there's a huge other change that takes place. And it also has an effect on the mind. Also in current times, in the kind of contemporary life that we live, it still is a fact that when you see fashion magazines, etc., and then here's your body going totally, you know, <laughs> out of that mold of what it should be on, the, on a shelf, mm-hmm. as in the Vogue magazine, you're still in that whole bind of how do you present yourself? How are you going to be? What is happening to you? You know, it's very much present. And therefore, there's one work that I have made, which is to do with a poem of Vishlava Zimborska called Ballad of a Woman. It's a woman who's been killed. She's murdered. But she stands up and she starts to clean up. She takes away his clothes and she puts them away so that nobody finds them. Even the weapon has to be hidden. So even after her death, she's cleaning up, you know. So so it has to do a lot with being a woman and what society, the kind of burden all these decades and centuries have put on women. I think that it's, it's taking a toll. It's even now taking a toll. And as you say there, there's a tremendous engagement in your work with histories of sexual violence and general violence against women and girls indeed. And it's it's important for you also to relate to contemporary events and specific contemporary events and to name them as sources for the work, like you said with uh, Can yes, You Hear yes. Me earlier on. It, actually, everything that I do has to do with what we're going through now. It only has a relevance if it has been experienced today and what I choose to use as a reference point or a quote or anything even from literature of another period, it has to do with what we're facing now. And it's a way of keying in, a kind of way of trying to face it. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. The free app offers access to more than 350 cultural organisations through a single download, with new guides being added regularly. Recent additions to the app include PST Art, the Getty's landmark arts event involving dozens of organisations across Southern California, and the East Hampton Historical Society in New York State. Among the guides on Bloomberg Connects are numerous museums and galleries where Nalini Malani has shown her work, from the Whitechapel Gallery in London to the ICA in Boston, Massachusetts, to the Juan Miro Foundation in Barcelona. If you download the guide to the Miro Foundation, you can read about its latest exhibitions, find out more about Tuan Andrew Nguyen, the winner of the 2023 Juan Miro Prize, which Nalini herself won in 2019, and explore the foundation's collections and its remarkable building. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, download the app today. It's available from the App Store and Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram.
let's talk about your studio. What do you have pinned to your studio wall? I have lots of stuff. <laughs> I have two steel cupboards and I have a whole lot of magnets, which I then I run over the other. Well, I do have some of my reproductions of my own work because, as I said, one work pushes out another and I work in a series. Mm. Often the subject is huge and it doesn't fit in one frame. It's an event that's happened and it's something that's disturbed me immensely and, and then it has to go on and on and on till it comes to its exhaustive end. Right. So there's a lot of details to my own work. And there's a very early work that I did for the play uh, Medea Material by Heiner Müller where I had made wall drawings and it was called Despoiled Shore which had to do with ecological disasters and also the position of the woman that is Medea herself in the story of Medea. So that's up also because it was done in 1993 and that year we had very bad sectarian violence in Bombay, huge riots right? and there was a bomb scare and there were bombs even in town. So there was a lot happening at that time and I have that pinned up. And the other work that I have are details from Piero La Francesca, The Legend of the True Cross. I adore that work. It has taught me a lot. It's, for me, an immersive work when you actually see it in Arezzo. And, and the storytelling is something that uh, I, I really appreciate very much. And Piero La Francesca's figures are almost life-size. And I have tried to also, in my wall drawings, try to make them life-size. So when you're standing next to such a figure, you become part of that environment, you know, or try to be part of that environment. So these are the things that uh, I have at the moment. I have a large photocopy of Helen finding the, that is uh, Constantine's mother, uh, finding the true cross. How nice. <laughs> so that's also pinned up. <laughs> There's an amazing thing that um, Philip Guston spoke very interestingly about Piero and his, on the one hand, that sort of very clear visual imagery which artists can pick up on, but also a sense of mystery and an absolutely ungraspable sense. Yes. And it seems to me that so often the artists that we keep returning to are those that somehow imbue their work with at once a clarity and a mystery. But again, returning to your work, that's one thing I find very clear is that on the one hand, there's, there's no doubt what the subject and, the, and your conviction in terms of the subject matter, but there's all sorts of poetic and lyrical associations. You want to encourage those, don't you? Yes, I certainly do. That would be, I mean, that's a plus point. <laughs> right. So, yes, yeah, so you, you set up a situation to a certain degree with the work and then you want to allow your audience the freedom to make associations. That's right. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? It's actually my years in Paris, the two years I was there from 1970 to 72. And I always say Paris was the university of my life. To try to give you a sense of what life was like in Bombay, uh, we were leaning more towards Eastern Europe and uh, the Soviet bloc. Also, there weren't so many publications coming in from the West and especially from philosophy and things like that. So going to Paris and even going to lectures at the Sorbonne was for me a real eye-opener. And it taught me a lot about India. And my neighbor, where I was living in, in, the, in the West Bank, she was doing a, her PhD on the caste system in India. And my first deep dive into what is the caste system was by reading Louis Dumont on, it was called uh, Homo Hierarchicus, mm -hmm. an amazing uh, detailed research into what caste was about. Because my family, I was born in Karachi, and we came as refugees. I was barely a year old in 1946. Mm -hmm. And my mother's side was Sikh, and my father's side, they were theosophists. And in that part of the world, caste as such was not as prevalent as, say, in parts of what was then to be India. So for me, it was a way of learning more about India. And of course, you were often asked questions, because at that time, hardly anybody spoke English. So you really had to buck up and try to understand why somebody was asking you things like, you guys are hungry and you're, you don't eat the cow? Are you mad? You know, things of that nature. And I said, oh, yeah, why? Are <laughs> <laughs> You know, so you had to, as a young person, have uh, ways and means to answer this. And I mean, often I didn't even know why the hell we were not eating the cow. 
<laughs> right. Uh, but but in Paris, you encountered extraordinary cultural figures, right? You went to yes. lectures by Bart and Chomsky yeah. and so on. And did, right, you right. even saw Sartre and de Beauvoir around and things. Well, yes, actually, they were very open. And we used to go have coffee with them at uh, Montparnasse. Also, the aura of 68 was still there. Right. So 68 was key, you know, it was like there was the Black Panther movement and there was this whole thing in Vietnam happening and we were all constantly on the streets demonstrating against Nixon and, uh, you know, it was a very turbulent time politically and a great awareness amongst young people. There was one building where the liberal left, let us say, not the Marxists and not the communists, but the liberal left, right. like Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre and Michel Leris, they would give lectures. And they, I met Arafat over there. Oh, right. How so, amazing. Yeah. No, it's amazing. And, you know, Godard was often there with his porter pack because <laughs> he was planning to go and live in Palestine. <laughs> No, it was an absolutely very rich time to understand what life could be in the future and what life could be back home when I came back. I can imagine. So that was the time that something really turned. And that stayed with me. Even now, these are the writers I still keep reading and they've had a big influence. Well, that's a very good segue because the next question is, which writers or poets do you return to the most? Um, Heiner Müller has been with me and I carry him around everywhere since the time I did Matteo Material. And then I've also done a video play called Hamlet Machine. That was the first work I saw by you because it was shown in Century City at Tate Modern. That's I, right. I yes. Wow. Yes. <laughs> yes. Then I worked with a Bhutto dancer. There are sections of Heiner Miller's work that I have often in my animations and in my paintings as well. Yeah. He was a leading sort of postmodern theatre person, effectively. That's so right, is it, yes. is it, But is it his writing specifically that you're interested in, as in the scripts and so on? That's right, his scripts. I had never seen his work in person, I mean, in the flesh. Some of the stuff is on YouTube, but of course that's never the same as actually seeing it. The language he uses is the classical and the graffiti. You know, so it's a very interesting and it's something that has stayed with me, you know, by using the story of Hamlet from Shakespeare. And we all know that. And then he uses things that you would see on the wall. You know, it's almost like a Basquiat, you know, that you have that. And or say an Arto, you know, this Arto and Bertolt Brecht mixed here, you know. So I think that this really, it sort of opened up many ideas. His work did a lot for me. Right. And the way that you use text in your works is very much like that in the sense that sometimes you'll have like a page from a book right. at moments, but then at others you'll have very, very sort of urgent words written, right. yes. very much scrawled like graffiti, as you say. Tell us more about yeah. how you yeah. use text. Yes. Yeah, so as I said, writers that I love and I carry around with me, even when I travel. So those things come back to me every now and again. I mean, T.S. Eliot has been there for a long time, especially mm. The Wasteland. Then uh, Lewis Carroll, always. Yes. And of course, as you've already mentioned, the Greek uh, mythological figures who, are, who f feature in old plays, the tragedies, the Greek tragedies, as well as in modern times. Indian myths as well. Indian writers have uh, used characters from the epics. And uh, again, I have them as a link language. Everything I read, I try uh, to have it come into the work as well, into a visualization, because I'm really very envious of writers. I mean, because it's the poverty of means. You, you know, you, all you need is a pencil and paper, and there you go. You know, it's just amazing how these thoughts and ideas and sensibilities and, you know, very fine emotions can feature on a written page. And I... It's impossible sometimes to visualize that in a, a visual form, let's say. You mentioned Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland there. And yes. Alice is a recurring yes. image. I know she, yes. she was in both Can You Hear Me and My Reality is yes. Different is actually yes. a quote from, um, from Alice, isn't it? <laughs> yes. What is it about that story? Is it about that constant questioning, if you like, that's so significant within that? Questioning, yes, of course, but also the startling juxtapositionings. I mean, what is forever? It could even be just a second. Mm. Amazing things, just amazing what this man has created. And then, of course, I was really struck by something you said that when COVID hit and time had shifted for so many of us in so many different ways, you turned again to Proust. Yes. Why Proust? And does that also come into the work? Yes, so much to do with memory, isn't it? À la recherche de ton père, tu, I tried to read him in French. The slowness, I just had to mm. slow everything down. I was actually stuck in Amsterdam for two years. 
couldn't come back to Bombay. I went even beyond my visa. So it wasn't the worst place to be, no doubt. As I was told not even to think about coming back to Bombay, things were very bad. And so I started with reading Proust. It sort of calmed my soul, let's say, because things that were happening in Bombay were really extremely tragic. Many other things happened. COVID was one big tragedy, but also the fact that so many people lost their jobs and had to walk home. Yes. Because here the government announced they had closed down all means of transport. So you could see these people, you know, dragging their suitcases, the children on their hips. It was horrendous. I made a lot of drawings at that time, huge amount of drawings and animations, but the drawings were where I had most of these things from different texts coming in. And I know another writer that's been tremendously important, you mentioned her earlier, is, is Wislava Zimborska. Yes. She's a poet. She's a Nobel yes. Prize winning poet. Yes. But there's an economy, it seems to me, in the yes. language, which must appeal to you. Absolutely. I mean, there's one which is particularly poignant, which is uh, nothing twice. She says, nothing happens twice. We come here improvised. There's not a moment where you can redo anything. It just is, it is as it is. No two drops of water are even the same. So nothing ever happens twice. And I've done a lot of work on that. The other work that I like very much is uh, about maps. I like maps, she writes. And why does she like maps? Because you don't see the graveyards in the maps. Right. It's all lovely colors and so on. So you don't know where the disasters have taken place. So they're simple things, but there's a profundity which is immense. The other one is about war. Okay, so the war is over. Who's going to clean up afterwards? Who's going to cut the grass? Who's going to bury the bodies? And so, yeah, amazing woman, amazing. Going back to T.S. Eliot, it struck me that one of the ways in which Eliot might be useful to you in your own work is his ability in the wasteland to use classical text alongside contemporary vernacular. That's right. That synthesis of language. And you synthesise languages, don't you? Yes. The way that the texts appear is very much in a sort of collaged form. That's right. Absolutely, yes. So there's T.S. Eliot, who has done a lot with the vernacular, and also an American writer... Grace Bailey. Oh, yes. Grace Bailey, you can hear the Jewish Bronx in the way she writes. And I pick up these things because it has so much to do with uh, the English we speak. Indian English is very different from English that you speak there. Right. So often people say, oh, we are speaking a foreign language. What is all this? I said, it's not foreign anymore. <laughs> I don't think the English will, <laughs> will recognize our English to be their own anymore. <laughs> What music or other audio do you listen to in the studio? So I listen to a lot of Indian music, classical Indian music. But uh, having said that, it's North Indian music more than South Indian music. Because North Indian music is called khayal, which means ideas ah. uh, or thoughts. Largely is about improvising, but within certain notes, it's a given. It depends on what rag you're going to be singing or playing. You have the seven notes as you have it in Western music with all the semiquavers in between. But within that structure, the ascending and the descending scale, you can improvise. That is the basic form. I'm not an expert, but for the little I know, but I appreciate it very much. But there's two forms of this khayal which I really enjoy very much. One is called Tumri, and Tumri is largely sung by women, and we have it today in its pristine form because, you know, people didn't mess around with women's music. <laughs> it's, it stayed pretty pristine, and uh, we do hear it even today in that form, but it's got contemporized, you know, in the sense that women are singing it in a more contemporary way. The other form is Jugalbandi. Jugalbandi is like two instruments together it will be a sitar and uh, the tabla, and a sitar mm. and a flute. And then they play within that rag. It's improvised as you sit at the concert. But let's not say it's like jazz. It is not at all like jazz. A lot of people say, oh, Indian music, jazz. No, uh, because the beat is very different. You know, it's, uh, the beats are very complex. 
It is improvisation. That's the only word one can use is the common factor between jazz and uh, Indian music. But it is different. Uh, and even a jazz musician will say it's not the same. Right. And, uh, but I also like jazz. I like Thelonious Monk very much. All uh, right. And the early Miles Davis. Tell me, when you're in the studio, do you listen to different forms of music according to different types of work? Because, of course, the work of editing a video, the work of working with moving images is very different to the work of drawing. So do you have different modes within the studio? Well, I don't listen to music while I'm working because I think music needs all my attention. And if I have to listen to music, I just listen to music because it's just sublime. You know, I just have to... Yeah. But I make my own music with GarageBand for my animation and also for, in reality, is different. I had Alak's voice of a colleague, theater person, mm. but the other kinds of sound is something that uh, I don't call myself a composer, but I certainly work on the audio part of my work. But it's super striking. I mean, my experience in my reality was different. Was you know, it was almost, and I sense that this was very deliberate. It was almost overwhelming. It was it was thunderous the, the sound. Right. The voice. Did you find the voice as such? Yes, exactly. Well, there, there was that combination. Okay. You had this insistent voice running through the work. Right. But then also, like at one stage, you had Rule Britannia. Yes. And then, <laughs> and then sort of incredibly thunderous sounds. So it yeah. felt to me like in the same way that you would shock us with images and, and bursts of text. You wanted the sound to, to yeah. have the same properties. If you like. That's what, yeah, I did. <laughs> Were you feeling uneasy about that? Well, yes, but surely that's the point, right? I mean, I, um, there was. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> that Britannia thing came because I was walking around in the parade grounds in, in London and I said, oh, good Lord, this is where it all happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. What other media influence your work? Well, there's music and there's poetry and there's dance and uh, theatre. Theatre is my first love, actually, but I can't do much here in India. I have collaborated, like the Jugal Bandi, with a very fine artist from Australia, Fiona Hall. Mm -hmm. we, I like to make books. And uh, she and I, we made a book together in 1996. And at that time, we were posting pages of the book to each other. It was based on water and how water has depleted because of the Industrial Revolution, which has had such bad effects on environment and not having bothered to care about what else this revolution could do. Mm -hmm. So this entire book is called Water. And Fiona had done a course in bookbinding, and she bound the book together. It opens at two ends. There's her beginning and my end or something like this. It's a big chubby book that we made. And we were posting pages to each other so we could react to each other. It was quite an amazing project. So I was collaborating with her and also with Alaknanda Samar, the voice that you heard. She actually was a performer who lived in London. Mm. Last year she passed away, unfortunately, so she couldn't even come to the show. Uh, but uh, she, she did Medea with me. Yes. Uh, she performed Medea. We couldn't afford another actor. We couldn't afford Jason. So Jason only appears on a television set. So right. she interacts with. <laughs> so, yeah, so theater is something that I absolutely love. And, uh, of course, film. I made film in 1969, as you mentioned already, Dream Houses. I made five films at that time in a workshop in Bombay, a 16mm and 8mm. We were watching a lot of East European cinema, and the two... Films that uh, at that time influenced me, and uh, I rewatched even now. One was called I'm 20. It was a Soviet film by the filmmaker Marlene Kutsev. And uh, the other film was Closely Watched Trains. It was a Czechoslovakian uh, filmmaker, Yiri Menzel. These were the two. Later on, uh, it was uh, the Bengali filmmaker, Riti Ghatak. Everybody loves, of course, Ray. Yes. And he's a classic, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But uh, Riti Ghatak is not that well known outside of India. I think the BFA has him in the archives. But this is the filmmaker to be, really, if you have the time to, uh, mm. to see his work, especially on partition of the east of Bengal. Because there also, there was a huge partition that took place. And, and so in terms of the films that you've been inspired by, it seems to me that all of this is within what we would call the territory of experimental film. And it obviously appears that you are constantly wanting to produce experimental film in the sense that, you know, pushing the format and the form of the film as well as the imagery, if you like. 
Yes, yes, absolutely. Because the film I made after I saw I'm 20, mm. I had access to a 16mm camera. And the film I made is called Still Life. And it's only to do with objects, intimate objects in a room. And I become the protagonist with the camera. So there is no person, but the camera becomes the protagonist and lives a life through these objects. You know, at that time, I was also reading Eisenstein's film form and film sense and so on, mm. trying to educate myself. So all of this appears in this short film. The strange thing is this all happened in the 60s and the 70s, and the museum here is going to finally show those two decades of my work. So that is something that I'm looking forward to. That sounds great. Yeah. Is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? I draw. I try to draw every day because if I don't draw, I, I don't know how to put down my thoughts. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have words. It's through drawing that an idea emerges. This is how I do it ever since I was at the art school, actually. And can that be still whatever drawing medium you happen to have nearest to you? So from my pad to a pencil? Yes, because there was a time when two years I had no studio. Mm. So I had a studio on the move. I used to have a satchel in which I carried sets of books based on the street where I had my studio, which was at a wholesale market. And uh, it's a place called Loharchal, where there's a kind of a hierarchy of division of labor, etc. And uh, you couldn't take a camera there and shoot people. You were entering people's living rooms and on the pavement. Right. So it was with memory. I, I just had to memorize what I saw. And all of this I put into this moving studio because I had no studio. So for two years, I was living with this bag and now with the iPad, it has the same, it's like a studio on the move. And then I can also put sound on it, which is great. If you could live with just one work of art, what would it be? Ooh, what, that's also a very difficult question. The Piero <laughs> da Francesca, I would want all of that big Arezzo. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it's an immersive artwork and it's just, you can't stop looking at it. I've been there twice. And I love the story, the, na the narrative. It's, it's so cinematic. And his ability to fix on aspects that you might not expect to be exactly. the kind of crux yes, of the yes. story. Yeah, That's yeah. absolutely. And the dignity of the people. I mean, there's a kind of, a, you know, the tilt up of the face and the head. It's just, uh, it's a masterpiece. And lastly, what is art for? Well, again, a line from the Cheshire Cat. Imagination is the only weapon in the war against reality. It's a difficult line because there's the word war in it. But I think that art gives the imagination that portal. And it's only through all the art forms, be it painting, sculpture, music, cinema, all of it. And especially, I think, cinema, because it's available to everybody and everyone can partake of it. It can really open up the mind. And that's where imagination against uh, the reality principle, let's say, in the Freudian sense, can be faced. Nalini, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It's been really wonderful talking to you. Nalini Milani, Can You Hear Me and Ballad of a Woman are at Concrete in Dubai in collaboration with Volte Art Projects from the 25th of February to the 3rd of March. Nalini Milani, The Pain of Others, 1966 to 1979, is at the CSMVS Jahangir Nicholson Art Gallery in Mumbai in India from the 1st of August to the 5th of November. Work by Nalini features in Ambiente, 1956 to 2010, Environments by Women Artists 2 at Maxi in Rome from the 9th of April to the 6th of October and and In Search of Vanished Blood is going to be shown at Tate Modern in London in its free collection displays from the 13th of December this year to September 2025. And that's it for this episode and indeed this series. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Do also subscribe to our sister podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every week. And please subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram and Threads. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producer is Lewis Jepp. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway. A big thank you to Natalie Milani. We're back on the 27th of March. See you then. The Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.